grand. Okay, so welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this six in the webinar series, the Tri Biosphere webinar series with our friends in Kerry and Dublin Bay, um, marking, of course, the 50th anniversary of the UNESCO Man in the Biosphere program. Um, and we're an official, officially accredited 50th anniversary event, which is really lovely. Um, before I introduce our speaker today from the Isle of Man, um, I'd like to invite um, Eleanor over in Kerry, first of all, and then Dean in Dublin Bay Biosphere to say, if you just share a few words about your biospheres too. One of the pleasures of this is that we're learning a little bit about each other's biospheres as we go along. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'm delighted again to be part of this lovely group of biospheres that have come together to this year long event. Um, it's really exciting for me, I suppose, because it's my first year in this position as well. So it's been great to be able to share and learn from the expertise that already exists in the Isle of Man and in Dublin Bay. So that's been fantastic. But the Kerry Biosphere is actually a mountain biosphere. So we're located in the middle of County Kerry, really. We hope we're home to Ireland's highest mountain range, the McGillicuddy Reeks. Um, and Clowney National Park, which is Ireland's oldest national park as well, and home to our last uh, native red deer herd, which is really interesting and pose interesting management concerns as well, because we're also one area that has the largest remaining stand of native oaks. Um, but of course, this webinar today is actually about the marine environment, and Kerry is a hugely, hugely popular place for people interested in the marine. We're one of the best places in Ireland to um, go out whale watching and see some of the, the larger animals that come because we're just on their migratory routes as they pass the coastline here up the west coast of Ireland. So we're very excited to learn about the Isle of Man's nature reserves. And I think it'll be very interesting for people in Kerry to hear about your experience in that too. Thanks, Eleanor. So um, over to me in Dublin. Um, so, you know, we're one of the, yeah, few biospheres that have a capital city at its heart and um, we've over 300,000 people living within the biosphere which um, brings about uh, lots of benefits and its own challenges as well but you know the best thing about this partnership and um, you know, working together is uh, the learning off of each other and we've just recently launched the Dublin Bay Biosphere Award I'm going to have to share this with you this wonderful badge now this was developed in partnership with Scouting Ireland and it gives young people the opportunity to get outside, explore, learn a little bit about the processes that are going on in nature and then take action to protect the biosphere. And this was actually inspired by our good friends on the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man um, have a scouting badge um, that relates to the Isle of Man biosphere. Um, and I thought that was an absolutely fantastic idea and it's something that we would like to do ourselves. And we've progressed that and we actually officially launched it there this day last week with, um, with Minister Roderick O'Gorman. Um, and it's great that we have this partnership, this opportunity to learn off each other. And I do believe, Eleanor, I do believe uh, coming to a biosphere near you. Yeah, there could be a third biosphere bad, which would be amazing. Yes, um, yes, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully fingers within crossed. The year. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, um, and, and like I say, the, these badges give people an opportunity to really connect with the biospheres and learn a little bit about what's happening in them and, and do something positive. Um, and I know UNESCO are very keen to give young people the opportunity to have a voice and, and um, you know, make their voices heard and, and to do something. And they, they're keen to and we're keen to support that. So thank you, Joe, and everyone at the Isle of Man for um, providing us with that inspiration. Thanks both for sharing a bit about your biospheres. And <clears throat> I think one of the great pleasures of being involved in the biosphere mo movement is the ability to learn from and cooperate with each other you know, on a global scale and also on a UK and an island scale. Um, so down to today's webinar then. We make no apologies for returning to the sea today. Um, the sea is actually 90% almost of our biosphere. Um, and it intrinsically affects all of our lives in the Isle of Man. Um, but how much do we actually really know about it? Um, sea fisheries alone is worth £20 million to our economy and supports around about 300 jobs. Um, the Queen Scallop is famous the world over as a Manx delicacy, of course. Um, and of course, since time immemorial, people have used the sea to, to work and to earn a living. But these days, more and more people are using it for leisure purposes, and there are all sorts of burgeoning businesses in the Isle of Man. People, you know, uh, stand up paddle boarding and all kinds of other um, uses of the sea. So people are, people, are, people are sharing that space and the sea also offers us well-being and also, of course, artistic inspiration. And all this has to be balanced with 
conservation of sensitive species and life-giving habitats, which provide us with a huge range of ecosystem services. When we became a UNESCO biosphere back in 2016, we had one marine nature reserve. And today, thanks to the joint working of those who, who share an interest in the sea, we have 10 marine nature reserves. Today's speaker, Dr. Peter Duncan, is the Isle of Man government's senior marine uh, environment officer. And he's been heavily involved in the creation of these uh, Manx, uh, marine nature reserves. And he'll shortly tell us all about these beating blue hearts of our biosphere. If you have any questions as the webinar develops, please place, place them in the Q&A section rather than the chat section. And they'll be either at the top or the bottom, depending on how you're looking at your screens. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of time afterwards to go through your questions. Thanks very much. Um, and just hand over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Um, I'll just click to share my screen. Okay. That's, um, that's shared full screen, Peter. Fantastic. Thank you for that confirmation. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Joe. Um, as you say, this is this is about our marine nature reserves. Uh, we've done a previous uh, presentation about one of the marine nature reserves at, at Calf and Ward Bank. Um, but there, as Joe said, there are 10. And today is an opportunity to, to cover some of the other ones, but also highlight that point that Joe made about the fact that the, share, the sea is very much a shared environment. And and the marine nature reserves are there to protect, but also to enable that sharing process. Um, I have the privilege of, of working uh, predominantly in my role with the marine nature reserves, but there's an awful lot of people who contribute in various ways, including some of the images and videos that we'll, we'll see today. So um, we came up with the title about Beating Blue Hearts, and that was a little bit off the cuff, but but if you can see that animation, the more I, 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 I thought about this, the more appropriate it seemed. They are um, isolated, not isolated, but centralized um, areas, and they do produce a life-giving force to the rest of the territorial sea. And in that sense, if you, if you think of that concept as we go through, I think it is actually an appropriate term. The webinar today, I'll just give you an overview of what, what we're planning to do. We'll start from really the beginning, what the purpose of marine protected areas are. And we'll put it into a biosphere context and then look specifically at the Manx Marine Nature Reserves, how they came about. And then the, we're dealing with seven of them today out of, the, out of the 10. And what I'll do is I'll give you a little introduction about the, 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 the aspects of them that are not necessarily covered in the video. We'll then give you a brief introduction video, which is done especially for this webinar, and then a glimpse at, at what actually happens underneath the underneath the waves and, and show you some of our fantastic biodiversity. And then um, towards the end, I'll, I'll just um, have a, a, a glimpse into the future and see where we're, we're hopefully going with, with our marine nature reserves. So, very quickly, and, and I hope this doesn't pick you off, but I think it's important to, to outline how we got to where we are at the moment. What is a marine protected area? So, it encompasses both the seabed, if you like, the land under the water, the intertidal, subtidal. It clearly encompasses the water, but also the flora, the fauna, and also the historical and cultural aspects of of, of our life uh, around marine environments. And I think that's really important in a biosphere context. While they are predominantly there to protect flora and fauna, they're also there to protect and preserve and share the historical and cultural aspects of, uh, of our interaction with the sea. And I think that's a really critical component to, to, to bear in mind. Marine nature reserves or marine protected areas by definition are protected by law. Um, and I think that's another critical point. Without the recourse to the law occasionally, um, then, then they can't achieve their, their, their fundamental function, which is, is protection. If, if we look around the world, there are some very, very large marine protected areas. For example, um, in the middle of the Indian Ocean is the biggest marine park um, in, in the world. But in the case of the Isle of Man, 
the areas are much smaller and they form something of a network around the island itself. And, and that sense of interaction of the marine nature reserves, both ecologically, but also socially and, and even commercially, is a really important part. And I think that outlines essentially where the Isle of Man Marine Nature Reserve Network is. Um, so fundamentally, marine nature reserves, marine protected areas are there to protect particular marine habitats and species for various purposes. And I'll just very quickly go, go into those three main ones, four main ones, and just bear them in mind as we go through them. And you'll see that to varying extents, our marine nature reserves actually fulfill these. So first of all, is the fundamental objective of protecting um, biodiversity or recovering biodiversity in terms of particular habitats and species. Secondly, and really importantly, is fisheries management, whether that's specifically about, say, protecting an individual fish stock, or more generally about making sure that there's space for different types of fishing, whether that's pot fishing or mobile gear fishing, or even recreational fishing. So it can be used for many, many functions there. Um, also, the, Joe made mention of, of, of the fact that the marine environment is increasingly used by, by lots of different things, whether it's aquaculture or, or sustainable power generation or tourism or recreation. Um, sometimes activities uh, in the sea are, are not particularly compatible and it's useful to separate them either through something like zoning or, or a, bit more, a bit more spatial separation. And that allows each of the different activities um, to flourish um, as appropriate as, as, the, as the particular area um, requires it to do. And lastly, and again, importantly, from a biosphere perspective, is areas for the provision of science, research, education, and increasingly a recognition that that the sea provides ecosystem services to us that we don't always recognize, but they're really important in, in, in our, our functioning and also in supporting all the other activities that, that take place in our coastal waters. So I think that, that, that summary, that diversity of purpose and function really well describes the current situation of the network around the Isle of Man and, and actually how we got to that point. So um, I, in, in preparing for this, I had a, I had a look at the UNESCO um, website and it says biosphere reserves are learning places for sustainable development. Each site promotes solutions, reconciling conservation of biodiversity with its sustainable use. And I think that's a, a really neat way of describing what our marine nature reserves are about. There is no question that they are there to protect marine habitats and species, but we also have to recognize that they are shared areas with other species and habitats. And that legal protection allows us to ensure that we find a way, and, and, and each one is, is really different, just as each biosphere is different, that we actually find a way for, to reconcile all of the varying um, requirements of marine protected areas and just flicking up some, some images from around the coast here, and some of which we'll talk about as we, as we go through that today. Um, <clears throat> we should also remember that, that, that people have different views of, of, of the sea, and some of us are, are, are heavily into conservation and biodiversity, and some people make a living from it, and other people see it as a recreational. And as I said, the marine nature reserves are intended to to, to contribute to fulfilling all of those tasks. So um, let's talk about the Manx Marine Nature Reserves. This is a map of them in the context of, of the territorial sea, which is the yellow part, which goes out to 12 miles. The, the, the dark blue and light blue areas is the not to three territorial sea. Uh, um, and, and all of the marine nature reserves are found within that. So as Joe mentioned, there are 10. I'm going to be covering seven of them today. They got their legal designation back in July 2018 under the Wildlife Act, which is a, a specific piece of Max legislation. Now, the designation was, was twofold. One is a designation order, which outlines 
fundamentally the area uh, in question. But importantly, there's a series of bylaws that accompany that designation order, and that really puts the kind of fund the, the basic restrictions that are required to ensure that the features within the marine nature reserves are protected. So from an Isle of Man context, the marine nature reserves are the equivalent of marine, uh, national nature reserves on land. So it's the highest designation under law that we can, we can um, ascribe to a protected area. I mentioned that all of our marine nature reserves are within three miles. Those are the dark blue areas on the map. Um, I won't go into the constitutional uh, matters surrounding the, the wider territorial sea, but suffice to say that it's a lot easier for us to designate particular things within that three mile area. And that's where most of, most of them are, all of them are in fact. Um, but it's also that area with, with actually the most biodiversity, um, uh, habitats and species, and the piece that comes into most contact with humans and therefore the bit that you need to manage most of all. Um, Joe mentioned 80% of our territorial sea, more than 80% is, is marine. It's about 4,000 square kilometres compared with the land area of 430 square kilometres. So it, it is big, although small in, in global standards. And one of, one of the, the drivers for the marine nature reserves was commitments that we've had and many other places have had to achieve 10% marine protected areas. And, and, and the, the current network actually achieves that with 12%, with although in the context of the not to 3 it's actually more than 50%, which is within marine nature reserves. Um, they are, the marine nature reserves are core biosphere areas, although when the, the biosphere Isle of Man was, was first designated, they were not all in position. Um, I think that was in 2016. So, so that's a map of, of the designation papers. But I think as we as we as we go to review um, the biosphere status in, 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 in the next few years, then those those new core areas, if you like, along with the existing terrestrial areas, will, will become formally the core areas. And I just put up that we do have a web page on the government website if you want to know a little bit more about about our MNRs. So that, that I think puts it into the context of a of a of a legal, hopefully not too boring um, insight. But but it is important because legal protection is fundamental. So I mentioned at the beginning there's a number of reasons why marine protected areas are established. And that's certainly the case. Our history goes back 30 years back to 1989. Um, and, and, and to be honest, the first ones were really established to protect fisheries interests and ensure sustainable fisheries. And whether that's for research or for restocking purposes or recruitment sources for new, for new juveniles or the separation of gear that I mentioned, um, we see that in Port Erin and the Arbel and Benacarake and Douglas and in Laxey. And I will uh, mention the specifics of them as, as I go through. Um, some of them, as you would imagine, are, were specifically designated for biodiversity and habitat. So the Calf and Wart Bank that I talked about a few, a few months ago, Ramsey and Little Ness were designated to protect particular species or habitats. And that dates back to, to a, a project that started in 2008, whereby all the data that we, we had, which is actually quite considerable for the marine environment, was assessed as part of a Manx Marine Nature Reserve project, which identified the key areas that really required that kind of protection. And so that was fundamental in, in the designation process that we, that we eventually followed. Um, and lastly, the Isle of Man, um, I think everyone understands the, the, the constitutional context of it, um, but we, we do sign up to various international conventions via the United Kingdom including OSPAR, which is the, the conservation of, of, of the Northeast Atlantic, habitat species, etc., but also various international conservations, such as conserv con the, con sorry, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And we have a, 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 a biodiversity strategy as part of uh, the Isle of Man government um, to address that. And so, as, as I mentioned, there are various requirements that we protect habitats and species, and, 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 and one of them was that, that target of 10% of, of marine protected areas by 2020. 
which we have, we've, we've thankfully now achieved. So, so over that 30 year period, starting um, down in the southwest with, with Port Erin in 1989, a 30 year period almost, by 2016, the network of protected areas constituted fisheries closed areas, fisheries restricted areas, and they were under the Fisheries Act. We had conservation zones and we had one marine nature reserve under the Wildlife Act. Now, it was a little bit clunky and having it dispersed between different bits of legislation was, was not ideal in many cases. But actually, when we look at what we're trying to achieve with them, all of them were consistent with a, a marine nature reserve designation. So we took all of our diverse marine protected areas, held a public consultation to make sure that the public were involved, stakeholders were, 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 were happy with what was being proposed, and designated all of them as a single uh, designation as a marine nature reserve in 2018. Okay, so, so we went from a, a really disparate number of different types of, of protected area to, to a single unifying one in 2018. And that does make life easier uh, from, a, from a management and from, from an enforcement, if you like, perspective. That said, and I don't expect you to read this, but just to show that, that, that we have it, each of the marine nature reserves while it had fisheries interests and, and, and a very important role in protecting long-term fisheries, um, each of them had its own habitats and species for designation, and this formed um, the justification for that, that uh, designation in 2018. So everything ranging from seabirds to fish to, to habitats to mollusks, you, various invertebrates are all on those lists. They're not exhaustive, but they were certainly the ones that we used to, to justify our, our, our choices. Okay, so um, starting our actual tour of the of, of the, the marine nature reserves. I'll start with Ramsey Bay, which is our largest and, and oldest designated in 2011, and it's a whole 97 square kilometres. And it's unique amongst our MNRs because it's based on a zoning plan. There are five zones, four of which are specific to habitats and species, um, and one of them is a fisheries management zone. And again, that's really unique and perhaps surprises people that that marine nature reserves can be compatible with, with, with fishing, and particularly fishing for scallops. Um, but it has been a fantastic example of, of, of conservation coexistence and the ability of, of a local fishermen to manage an area which is primarily conservation, but also provides um, um, options for, for future management. Um, the videos that I'll show in just a second really don't cover the fisheries in any detail, but I will just briefly indicate how it operates. It originated from a fisheries point of view because the fishery had been overexploited and actually closed in 2009. And the principle was that if you stop fishing it, then hopefully it recovers. And actually we found that the fishery had recovered. It took about four years to do so. But in 2013, the fishery was reopened, but under a really different regime, we divided the fisheries management zone right there in the middle, which constitutes about half of the, the total area, and did very in-depth surveys to find out precisely where the scallops were. Now, the fishermen agreed that they would take a, a, a certain amount. And in fact, by 2017, if you look at that bottom graph, we very gradually increased the amount that was taken until now, since 2017, this, that's the carrying capacity of, of that area. So we really feel we have a sustainable fishery. It delivers a significant amount of money in a very, very short time. So if you look at pre-2009, that whole area was fished, delivering the same amount. Now, and it was 365 days a year almost, and um, now it delivers the same amount from a much smaller footprint um, and it does so in 10 days and it's targeted at the Christmas market when 
the prices are at their highest. So we can save on efficiency of harvesting. We can save on fuel use, which is important in the context of blue carbon. It's a reliable source of product, and we can guarantee a higher price and hitting that particular market. So as I said, it's a, it's a really, really fantastic example of it. And we've learned so much to apply it to other areas of, of the Territorium Sea. And this is the sort of um, pretty clean catch, exceptional quality animals that come out of that particular fishery. This is Ramsey Bay Marine Nature Reserve, which was the island's first marine nature reserve established back in 2011. Now it's 90 square kilometres in size, which is why we've taken this wide angle shot to get everything in. The bay itself consists of five different zones. The furthest north is a horse mussel reef, um, so that's filled with horse mussels, soft corals, and is washed by a very strong current. Inshore from that is the conservation zone, which is mostly rocks, um, rocky shore, rocky reefs, um, algae, and the pink coralline algae called merl. Now further south, from the Queen's Pier down, is the biggest eelgrass meadow on the island. Moving eastwards towards Mackled Head is the, the fourth zone, which is the rocky shore zone. And in the middle of Ramsey Bay is the fifth zone, which is the fisheries management zone. Now Ramsey Bay is blessed with some really great hydrology. Um, it's warmer waters, it's nutrient rich, and so it, it, it proves the growth rates of all animals, but in particular scallops. This is a normal large scallop. This is a Ramsey scallop. So what we have is commercial fisheries and marine conservation working in harmony in Ramsey Marine Nature Reserve. This is Ramsey Bay Marine Nature Reserve.
Okay. Okay. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, insight into into um, and how we're going to run this this webinar uh, for the the individual webinars. Um, so this is Laxey Bay, um, a, a, a much smaller area, only about four square kilometres, and that started as a as a fisheries restricted area as part of a scallop restocking project. And it's predominantly sand and coralline algae habitats. And it does contain, in addition to Ramsey that we just saw, um, one of, I was going to say one of our four eelgrass zones, but last week we um, we finally got around to surveying and we found a fifth eelgrass zone, um, which, is, which is great news. It also uh, contains some of our oldest living, um, I say relatives, our, our inhabitants of the Elman, the Arctic clams, and, and an exciting new discovery which uh, we'll announce on, on, on the video to come up now. Um, the idea of networks of, of marine nature reserves is, is really quite simple and how they interact. Water moves around obviously and many different marine organisms, whether it's commercial uh, species or, or biodiversity species, produce plan planktonic larval stages. And actually, um, we, if, if we if we do some some clever modeling of, of, of how particles move in the ocean we can actually see where the particles in this case larvae come from and where larvae from that area end up so the top graph there shows where if you if you run back the plankton three weeks where the where the, the larvae have come from and the bottom one is what happens to larvae originating in Laxey Bay where do they end up after three weeks? And so that was really important in the formation of, of, of the original marine protected area network. Um, and in this particular case, uh, Laxey did produce scallops, but it was a, such a relatively small area that it was actually used with those models of larval distribution to do a research. The, 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 the scallops that you can see in the picture there came from Mulroy Bay in Ireland. Um, now they were put into, onto the seabed in two particular patches, and although ultimately um, th 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 there are not massive populations of scallops in there, there are still some, and so they, they, they continue to perform that particular function, as well as now under MNR designation, they, they, they protect a whole pile of other things, including, as I said, here. This is Laxey Bay Marine Nature Reserve, and this is dominated by sandy su seabeds. It's also got some uh, merle, which is a pink coralline algae in it, but most of the species we find here are sand-dwelling animals. So things like burrowing worms, burrowing sea urchins, seagrass beds, um, and also this species, which is the arctic clam. Now this one's a, a juvenile, they get darker as they get older, and can, can live for as long as 500 years. Laxey Bay was originally set up as a marine protected area as an experiment for restocking scallops, which were brought over from Ireland. Now that wasn't successful, uh, but there are still some scallops in the bay and they help repopulate and restock the fishing grounds offshore. One of the other important visitors to Laxey area is a pod of bottlenose dolphins, which come up from Cardigan Bay every winter.
So um, on to the, the next one. This is a, a, another interesting marine nature reserve, particularly because it, it occurs so close to the main town um, of, of Douglas, which is, has a population of 28,000 people. It's the, the island's busiest port, and, and it, it, it has also supported fisheries over, over the years um, and started off as a, as a larval resource. Um, having a, a town as busy as Douglas certainly presents some conservation challenges, as you can imagine. That, as I said, it's a busy port, uh, there's a marina, um, there's various um, and there's a requirement to, to maintain that as a harbour. There's various inputs into the in, into the bay itself uh, that we have to manage. But actually, when 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 we start looking at it, it's surprisingly diverse for 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 a, a wide range of habitats and species. This is Douglas Bay Marine Nature Reserve, and it might be a bit of a surprise to have one so close to the island's biggest town and port. But actually, there's quite a diversity of habitats here, everything from kelp forest, mud, sand, and even bare rock. And so that supports a, a wide range of different species. The marine nature reserves prevent the use of things like dredges and, and trawl gear inside them. And so that allows some of our smaller, more delicate species to survive. And in the middle of the bay here, we recently discovered a thing called Beaumont's nudibranch which is a small species of sea slug, pretty rare, only found in Norway and the British Isles. And we know that it's breeding here. And just offshore from Onken Head, some of the biggest species here, things like minke whale and spur dog, um, come here to feed on the herring that's collect offshore. One of our more dedicated marine observers has recorded 140 species in Douglas Bay. Um, and it's actually really important that we have people keeping an eye out because it's a busy port, so the prospect of uh, invasive non-native species is always an important consideration.
So I hope, I hope people aren't feeling too seasick so far. Um, just outside Douglas Bay is another um, marine nature reserve, which is at Little Ness. Again, relatively small, uh, 10 square kilometres, and it was designated for a single feature, which is a, a horse mussel reef, and it is one of our most important uh, marine sites. It actually backs on to an area of special scientific interest um, at, at Douglas Head um, and, and on Marine Drive, which is a, a, a road that runs along the top of the cliff. So it's, it's rapidly becoming a, a really popular place for, for people to, to explore and observe nature. Um, and quite remarkably, it was only discovered in 2008 by, by sea search divers, which I, I believe operate in, in Ireland as, as well as uh, in the UK and Isle of Man. Um, when we designate marine nature reserves, we, we, I've mentioned fisheries before, but we do have to take account of, of other users. And in some cases, the protection afforded to the marine species actually also provides protection for other um, infrastructure. In this particular case, we moved the boundary, which is a little bit odd if you think about it, is a little bit higher up than you might expect. And the reason we moved that was to protect um, the electricity cable that comes into to Douglas from the UK. So that protects that area from um, dredged fishing gear, for example, and so safeguards the, the, the infrastructure of the island. And similarly, um, in poor weather, uh, some of the larger vessels that are going into Liverpool Bay actually anchor up just off the Marine Nature Reserve, in fact, while well, they await a, a, a pilot to, to take them into the, the port of Liverpool. So by, by, by linking it to other users, and particularly ones that are, are, are not terribly demanding on the marine environment, it does afford some additional protection. So uh, this is... This is Marine Drive overlooking Little Ness Marine Nature Reserve. And this area is also an area of special scientific interest. So it's actually most uh, commonly used for people looking at seabirds, uh, peregrine falcons, and offshore we've got lots of uh, whales, uh, porpoises, and dolphins. But actually the reason it was designated an MNR was because of the horse mussel reef just offshore here. And that's one of the most diverse um, habitat types we have around the island. In just one small bucket sample, we've recorded 296 different species. Thank <laughs> you. 
So moving down the coast, um, the next one we come to is Lang Ness. Um, that's another really big area, almost as big as Ramsey itself. Um, and that, as you can see, extends all the way out to, to three nautical miles. Now, it's quite a diverse range of habitats here. Lang Ness Peninsula, which sticks out in, um, at the bottom of that T-shape, which has also uh, got an ASSI associated with it, is quite exposed in a really rocky coast. But inside, um, j just, just to the north of, of that peninsula with the, the, the pink area, is Derby Haven, which is much, much more sheltered in a soft sediment area. Um, and a really important overwintering and breeding site for, for a variety of, of seabirds, wading birds, etc. And it also has uh, one of our now five um, eelgrass areas contained within it. So here's the video for that. This is Lang Ness Marine Nature Reserve. And it covers quite a big area. It's got a, quite a diverse range of habitats from quite exposed rock areas such as here on Lang Ness Peninsula with the lighthouse behind me. Um, over to Derby Haven, which is much more sheltered and a soft sediment, muddy area, um, which is a great place for uh, watching wading birds and shorebirds, both in winter and in summer. Derby Haven also has one of the best uh, eelgrass areas that we've got, which is within the hiding place of the Groove Top Shell uh, for 180 years, which we rediscovered recently. Langness is also uh, an area of special scientific interest, so this area is really important because it allows us to conserve um, areas both on land and in the marine environment. Okay, uh, moving down to the south of the island is Baina Karaki or Karak Bay. Um, this also has uh, an eelgrass uh, bed and this particular one was originally set up to separate the mobile fishing gear of Queen's Scallops and Scallops from the, the pot fishermen of, uh, who are after uh, lobsters and crabs. Um, and it was an opportunity for fisheries management uh, project as, as well. Um, there have been various outcomes and benefits from that. Um, and I think one of them that, that we get anecdotally reported is that the general increase in, in, um, in biodiversity was in the bay itself. Here we are at Bay Nakaraki, or Carrick Bay in English. This place really has it all. Uh, further down the coast, there's the Sugarloaf, which is one of the best uh, seabird nesting colonies on the island. It also has uh, great kelp forests and its very own eelgrass meadow just in at Port St Mary. It's a, quite an exposed site and so it brings a lot of nutrients into the bay. So there's a lot of shorebirds um, and also things like porpoises and, and dolphins are, uh, attracted into the bay. Um, one of the more interesting things about this area is also the 300 million year old limestone platforms 
behind me. Um, that provides great rocky habitat for things like lobsters, but it also provides opportunities for fossil hunting. So last but not least, um, so that we've got time for some questions. Um, Nearble Bay is, um, as you can see, just around the corner and on the west coast. And this area is much more influenced by oceanic water. Um, if, you, if you see the, the map here of where the island is, the Atlantic water coming up through St George's Channel um, has a, a greater influence on the south of the island and, and the west coast. So it's, it, it's, it's deeper water, um, it's also cooler and lower in nutrients. And so it's, it's although hydrographic fronts occur on both sides of the island, um, it's very much influenced by them on the west coast. And what we see is things like basking sharks following the hydrographic fronts that concentrate uh, plankton and food in the water, similarly with seabirds. And also the scallop grounds at the north of the island are affected by um, the larvae concentrating above those grounds and then dropping out um, onto the seabed and making those productive grounds over time. Um, the, the, the southwest of the island is, is, is really dominated by sea cliffs and, and, and rocky um, sorts of habitats um, and I think is, is, is quite, a, quite a nice place to kill at this time of year. Um, Niarbo also originated uh, quite a long time ago now, um, from a, from a, a, a relocation of scallops, fisheries management, particularly on 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 very good fishing grounds, is quite difficult. And and scenes like this were commonplace at the start of the season. And so one of the initiatives was to move some of the scallops off that area before they were they were harvested and put into inshore grounds, of, which would at least guarantee that they were contributing to. Um, 
to, to branch further off. And I, I've mentioned fisheries a few times at, during this uh, webinar, and it really is important that, that, that particularly fishermen who use the sea uh, most, most often and commonly and with a historic interest are included in designations of marine nature reserves. So while that again that 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 project of moving scallops into this area, um, it's the, the animals don't grow particularly well here, but they do continue to provide um, larvae for 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 feeding those offshore grounds. The the bay itself is really divided into a gravelly sandy area in the, in the south and a, and a, a northern area which is is much more rocky. So we'll have a look at the video of that. Here we are at Nyarbal Bay Marine Nature Reserve, which stretches from Fleshuk, where we are at the moment, northwards to the rocky headland at Nyarbal. It's a really exposed area, um, so it's dominated by sea cliffs and caves and, and rocky headlands. Um, the bay itself is split into two different parts. In the south is mostly a gravel seabed, where scallops and arctic clams um, live. And in the north, it's mostly rocky reefs and kelp forests. The area is also swept by currents that come up from the Atlantic, and so it's a great place for, for seabird feeding and basking sharks. Um, um, so, I, I think the videos provide a, a little bit of an insight into into our underwater life that most people don't actually um, normally get to see, and what it is that we're protecting, which I think is important. But in terms of the future, um, I think the the marine nature reserves are really. Uh, they were established with stakeholder input, um, and it's really important to, to maintain that community appreciation and value of them. Um, but the, the more recent ones were set up, perhaps in, in a relatively simple way. Um, so, for example, we don't have no tape zones um, in, in, in any of them significantly. And so I think there is opportunity to develop them over time and also to integrate them with fisheries management. I have talked a lot about that, but as I said, it was an important part in it. And we have a management plan for the not to three, which fundamentally includes fisheries as well as the marine nature reserves. Um, I also think it's important that we maintain the monitoring side of, of the marine nature reserve. They cover 50% of our not to three, and therefore to justify that, 
um, that area, they need to be demonstrated demonstrably achieving what they set out to do. Um, and it also provides us, I've, I've covered a few examples of, of things that we, we simply didn't know were there or were lost. Um, and so the more that we look, the more interesting things that we actually find. And an example I think of that is how, how they can respond to, um, or how we use them to respond to crises is, is the increasing recognition that marine nature is ours or protected habitats and species can contribute um, to global problems such as, as, as uh, climate change. And the, the fact that the, the um, MNRs uh, and the marine environment in general stores and, um, and, and takes in carbon from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, means that it's one of the ecosystem services that MNRs uh, uh, can achieve. But fundamentally, they achieve that much better when the biodiversity and habitat protection is, is, is at a high level. Um, and so to end on a, a, another uh, slightly corny note, perhaps the future of, of, of this as much as blue as it is green uh, when we think of it. But um, I hope that's given you an insight into um, some of the some of the fantastic underwater life that we have here and, and what we're doing to, to help protect it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for um, a fascinating webinar. Um, thanks very much for going out and about filming for us. Um, it was great to see so much of our underwater ecosystem, something that, as you say, we don't normally get to see. Um, I think even the trip along, um, I think even the, even the sort of trip along um, the seabed at Laxey there really serves to illustrate, you know, the abundance of creatures we have and habitats we have just within a really tiny space. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm sure the challenges of managing a busy port stroke marine protected area are not, you know, it's something Dean is very aware of and conscious of in Dublin Bay Biosphere also. So um, I found that interesting. Um, we'll go straight to questions. We've got a good few questions um, and we'll take them in turn. So if you're ready to answer these, Peter. Um, the, first, the first question is from Mark, and he would like to know how is the protect how is the marine protected area, how are the marine protected areas monitored and enforced in the island of biosphere? Yeah, okay. So um, they're monitored at various levels for various purposes. Um, so some of it is, is opportunistic. Um, we fisheries are, are probably the best monitor because they're generally associated with with a, a, a good amount of money. Um, but associated with that is our associate uh, our links with Bangor University, who have had um, various students who have in fact and uncovered many of the, the features that, that we've had. Um, so uh, several of them were, were looked at using the sledge footage that you saw. Um, and also the, the, the bait footage that, that you saw as well. Um, so we are in the process of developing a more formal monitoring program, and that ties in with, with various other marine monitoring um, uh, aspects that we're looking at. Um, but it's certainly an ongoing uh, business. And, and as I mentioned at the end, the, the blue carbon, uh, which is increasingly important, um, is something that, we, we currently have a project in to, to better scope. We have very good habitat data around, around the island, actually, uh, as a result of Bangor University surveys. But I think that needs to be specifically tailored to, to blue carbon if we're to incorporate that into our, our climate change planning into the future. So it's ongoing. There's never enough, but um, we do what we can. And certainly the aspect of, of, of amateur uh, whether it be um, sea surf divers or just enthusiasts, sending us in records allows us to tell tell us what's there, and we we incorporate that onto our, our NBN, our biodiversity network, uh, which is public publicly accessible. So you can actually interrogate the the MNRs and find out what's living there. Fantastic. Um... Peter, um, brilliant. First off, uh, really, really fascinating. Some great imagery there. Um, a, a point here from Kerry Sharp. I mean, she says, amazing opportunity to see beneath the water, and I absolutely echo that. Um, could you comment on what she believes or is told is an ancient fish catching ring of stones? Is this something you're aware of? I, I, it's a I, secret. 
<laughs> sure, I, I have to say that my time is generally spent with, with, with present day things, but I am aware that there are various sites around the island. And I think there's one at Castletown, um, which is actually on the maps. It's sometimes quite interesting to look at old maps where people um, used uh, stranded rock pools to, to, as, as fish. So the idea of, 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 of our ancient ancestors constructing fish traps um, is, is, is undoubtedly happens and you could see various places around the island where that would that would occur because they, they, our ancestors didn't have the benefits of, of motorised fishing or, or uh, complicated rod and line and, and, and videos etc so yeah absolutely I, th I think it uh, uh, makes perfect sense Very good, thank you Thanks, um, Peter, for the, the whole presentation was so interesting. And, and as Dean said, the the videos were fantastic. Well done for getting out and making all of those. It was really lovely to see um, the places for real as you were talking about them. I think it gives you a really good uh, context of where, where you're talking about, which is for someone like me who hasn't been to the Isle of Man yet, but is very much looking forward to visit. It was a really, really lovely tour of the, the marine nature reserves. Um, just following on from the last question, <laughs> there's a, a question here about marine tourism and how it operates in the Isle of Man already. And do you see more opportunities for that? And how do you imagine that um, progressing forward in a sustainable fashion? Is there any conversation about that uh, currently around these marine nature reserves? No, I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great question and certainly one that we foresee um, happening in the future. We are absolutely blessed with, with a fantastic diversity of things already. And, and anecdotally and from our monitoring, although it's, it's difficult to you have a baseline and, and how have things improved, but certainly anecdotally we think um, things have improved, particularly in, in, in the marine nature reserves themselves. Um, how, so we uh, through biosphere, we certainly promote the idea of sustainable tourism and we've seen that in various biospheres around the world. Uh, from a commercial point of view, I suppose if you build it, they will come sort of idea. So I think there is a degree to which we as government need to work with tourism to promote it. And that allows uh, businesses to establish. And the fact that it's protected, the fact that we have codes of conduct in there, um, will be something that allows it to grow in a sustainable manner. That's the intent, certainly. Um, the other point I would make, and we've certainly been derailed in that by um, recent events, COVID, etc. Um, but we established a stakeholder group um, some time ago, which, which included um, tourism sector and, and ecotourism recreational uh, interests. And I think when we get back on track with that, then there will be a forum for people to input. And it gets back to that idea of whether it's zonation or some other mechanism, is making sure that there is space for everyone um, to do their, their, their activities as, as required and to make sure that those activities are sustainable in the long run. Fantastic. I think Great. that's Thank always you. the hardest part, isn't it? The balancing of everything. And you, you always have uh, so many stakeholders at play. So thanks. thanks is, and, uh, but I think that is the importance of having a, a formal legal uh, designation. It means that we, we can maintain that. And it, it starts that way and therefore people get used to it. And, and of course, to some extent, that is the role of a biosphere, isn't it? Establishing that, that sort of balance between people and the rest of nature, not forgetting that we are part of nature as well. So um, yeah. I'm going to combine a couple of questions now for time purposes, Peter, because we've got a good number of questions coming in. Um, you did touch on this briefly. Um, the question from Vivian, um, to what extent do we have a baseline to use for our monitoring? And um, Laura would also like to know, do we have plans to establish any more marine nature reserves in the future? Okay, um, so baselines are an interesting thing. In an ideal world, you would you would go out at the start of it all and, and do it all um, afresh, and there's your baseline, and you work from there. And um, typically, that's not usually possible. Um, we have had uh, a marine laboratory, or had a marine laboratory here for over a hundred years, so there's certainly a good baseline in terms of of the presence, absence of species in particular places. We've also, when, when the Marine Lab closed in Port Erin, then that, that scientific provision was taken over by Bangor University back in 2007. So we've, 
we've had over a decade, um, you know, approaching 15 years now of that relationship, and they've provided us with all sorts of things over time. We have a very good core scale habitat map of the territorial sea. As I mentioned, I think we need to we need to fine tune that a little bit, but it's a it's an excellent start considering. Um, and they've also provided through the use of students and supported by government and various uh, organizations to 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 establish baselines in particular areas such as Port Erin has been very well studied. We have good information on um, on Laxey and Benakariki, for example. Um, but it's an ongoing process, and, and I think over time we, we will certainly um, take our opportunities. I'll give you an example. Recently we had a, a telecommunications cable come through the Territorial Sea, which transatlantic came into Ireland, came across the Irish Sea, and two spurs into the Isle of Man. Now, they had to do some surveys and get uh, consents from us to do that, but we gathered an awful lot of useful information from their underwater surveys and found ourselves in another very high density. It's not a horse muscle reef, but a high density area of horse muscles. So we're opportunistic, certainly. And as blue carbon becomes increasingly important and the sea becomes important, I think, as I said, an established um, marine monitoring um, program is, is, is appropriate for an island nation. Um, in answer to Lara's questions, we, we don't have specific plans as such, but um, the, the Manx Marine Nature Reserve project back from 2008, although we've covered much of that, there are still some areas that we could protect better and some areas that as yet do not have protection. For example, the, the soft sediment, which is out towards the west and southwest, of the Manx Territorial Sea. And if we look on the UK side of that, there's there's um, special areas of conservation established there. So I think it would be a nice sort of synergy to, again, use what we've learned, balance fishing interests with conservation interests and make sure that that particular habitat, which which is, is actually less well known because it's so much further out, that, 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 that would certainly be something that I would be interested in looking at. Thanks, Peter. Peter, a uh, question here for you. Uh, it's close to my heart it's on education. Um, and is um, the marine nature reserves woven into the uh, school curriculum? And if not, is it should it be um, with a new education bill um, that's going through? Um, and can I ask a question? <laughs> Educate me, please. Um, <laughs> in the muscle beds, you mentioned a bucket sample. What, how, do you, how do you do a bucket sample? <laughs> how big is the okay. bucket for 290 odd species? Yeah, okay. two, two questions. In no worries. <laughs> so I, I, I can't speak too much about education policy. What I would say is um, Joe's work with Biosphere and making that um, so well known and, and, it, and certainly interacting with the schools has been fantastic over recent years. When you get to the specifics of marine nature reserves, then then that, that, that falls back to us. What we have done, and I haven't covered, and again, it's been delayed a little bit, but we have leaflets which are available online as well as spotter sheets for activities. Um, so the intent, we're nearly there to have, we have two online at the moment, but we have another eight, we have another six re almost ready to go in another two. And that, that provides some resources for families to, to engage in an educational component. Um, and certainly in the past, I've, I've given presentations on the Marine Nature Reserves to, to any school that asks. So without wishing to be inundated, um, we, we, um, we're, we're open to, to, to providing that. Um, and answer, Share those leaflets. Yes, absolutely. We will. Thank you. <laughs> um, in answer to your question about bucket samples, so it sounds a little bit ad hoc, but divers have clearly some challenges operating at 30 metres, but it's about 0.25 of a cubic metre. So if you can picture that, so it's a, it's a bucket, they take replicate samples and chuck it into it and separate it. So it's small buckets about that size, which amounts to a kind of a medium sized bucket. But it, I, I don't know if the video gave the impression, but that close up is absolutely heaving with life. It's absolutely fantastic. 
It, it really did actually. The the close up pictures were amazing, and and trying to to see all of the list of species in them as well was quite the challenge. Yeah. So that was yeah. really lovely. And there's a question come in here from Vincent Highland, who operates a business uh, just just in my own home place here in Cara Daniel in County Kerry called Wild Dairy Nan. And he's heavily involved in education around um, marine areas, marine conservation and ecology of, of everywhere, really. And he's asked, have you considered twinning with other sites or linking to other places as he feels this presentation? It was great and wonderful to see and could be very useful to kickstarting a similar process where we are. I, I would absolutely love to. Um, I, I, I think um, we do what we can do. And I think I do genuinely think that this type of webinar where we get the opportunity to, to spread the word um, and link in with people sharing the same um, the same experiences and challenges. And, and there is a fundamental difficulty in, 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 in showing the undersea world to people, which is why we went down the video line. And um, hopefully it does that. But I, a, a few years ago, I, when, shortly after Biosphere started here, I was fortunate enough to, to attend the meeting of island and coastal biospheres in Menorca. And it's an identical sized island in the Mediterranean with a similar sized territorial sea and so many of the same issues. And, and that meeting really drove home the fact that we, we can and should be sharing because we are in isolation and we get so much more out of it. And for example, we've recently been in contact with them about the, the blue carbon and to see what they're doing. But yeah, we're, we're open and increasingly as we put things online, and this was part of the intent of these videos, that they, they will be loaded up and be available for people to see. Um, just takes a bit of time to get there, but we will get there. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. And um, I'll share Vinny's contact details anyway, so you can check out his business. He does a lot of underwater filming too. So it'll be interesting Fantastic. to see the comparisons yeah. between the two places. A lot of people contributed to the various bits of video that we have. And we, we I've shown you a, a, a sort of two to three minute version here, but we actually have 10 minute versions of all of the MNRs. So, so uh, <clears throat> there's a, an hour and a half we have yeah. as a complete package, which we tend to, to show at things like the Festival of the Sea that the Max Wildlife Trust and others organize uh, every year. So bit of overload there, but it, it is available. Thank you, Peter. And I think I'm just keeping an eye on the time. It's a, maybe a short answer to this one so that we, we get finished up in time. But <clears throat> Dave wants to know, can eelgrass um, beds be re-sown and grown? Great question. Um, the short answer is yes, we believe so. And the, he's probably aware that many people are actually doing that. Um, it, the record goes back quite a long time, some successfully, and, and in the UK they're doing an awful lot because we've lost perhaps up to 90% of our eelgrass areas um, in, in, in recent, uh, in the last mm, less than 100 years or so. Um, so we certainly have, um, Max Wildlife Trust here have some money um, to, to start that work and Sea Search have been involved in that as well. So we've tried a few tests uh, mo uh, mo movements of, of eelgrass, but I think um, with the project funded by uh, Max Wildlife, uh, the Max Wildlife Trust have money for, and um, hopefully our, our project funded through government, we're certainly looking to en enhance um, the restoration of eelgrass meadows. But I would say that, that it, I, I attended a recent uh, workshop on it. It is much better to protect it in the first place rather than the expense and time-consuming efforts of having to replace it. So I think finding another one just north, between Douglas and, and, and Laxey, um, actually it's just north of Laxey, sorry, um, is it, really important because it gives us an opportunity to, to protect what we have rather than the, the, the labour and resource-intensive uh, operations of trying to fix it up once it's gone. So thankfully it's still there. So. That's, That's grand. It's, been a, it's been a very exciting month actually for um, you know Isle of Man marine stories because we had some minke whales breaching off the west coast of the island. We've had this discovery. We've had the confirmed re-establishment of you know sighting of some puffins on the calf of man, which was wow. the subject of one of our earlier um, webinars, still online of course. Um, very conscious of the time. I think it's time to bring things to a close now and to say thank you to you and to everyone who's contributed to your 
um, super videos with their photography and video. Thanks to our friends in Kerry and Dublin, and we look forward to the next webinar in July in Dublin, which um, will confirm the date and advertise it widely. Um, if anyone's appetite has been whetted by, by the photography that you've seen in this, we have our own biosphere event during Manx Wildlife Week on the 8th of July called Nature Through a Lens, where we have five of our leading photographers um, sharing their sort of photography story and some amazing photographs of the Isle of Man. It's free to attend and there are some places left and you can book via Eventbrite. So it'll be great to see some of you there if you've attended today. And um, yeah, just a big thank you again to everybody who's attended. And if you have any questions, uh, you can email biosphere at gov.in. Yeah, thanks very much, Joe. Uh, Jan was just saying, how can ordinary citizens get involved? Maybe that's something that, you know, you can share via email address. But yeah, look, it, brilliant, 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 Peter. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure we're talking about the tourism element. I'm sure this video, when it's shared um, by uh, our good friends in Kerry, uh, will be a wonderful advert for um, the Isle of Man. And um, I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to come over, um, God willing. So brilliant. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank Thanks, everyone. It's been a lovely, lovely day and definitely looking forward to visiting now and getting underwater to see some of these amazing marine yeah. treasures need, that you have. We need a so. snorkel tour, for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> <laughs> bye, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.